Welcome to Collegial Conversations with Diana Clark, the professional webinar series that offers clinical and personal perspectives on issues that are common, but often not talked about. Here is today's Collegial Conversation. Thank you for joining a Collegial Conversation with Diana Clark. Today joining Diana is Corey Greenberg. Corey focuses on building relationships and collaborating with community partners to share the mission of Pacific Preparatory and expand its students' base. Today, Diana and Corey will be discussing the topic of adolescent mental health and what educational resources are available for young children and also teens. Thank you so much for joining us today, Corey. I will now pass the conversation over to Diana. Thank you, Laura, and welcome, Corey. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. So I want to start, we could talk about Pacific Preparatory, but I want to start with how you wound up there, because I think that informs the conversation. So yeah, oh, I I love to talk about uh, my story today. In fact, is my one year anniversary with the company, um, which is feels really good. It's been one of the best years of my life, I have to say. Um, And I, I have had quite a journey professionally, I started off as um, a social worker. I went to grad school and I worked um, in child welfare for several years and um, then ran a, you know, community funded grant mentoring program um, for kids in the, you know, who are adjudicated and just, you know, was really in the trenches um, helping families through all kinds of situations. And then um, I started a family with my husband and had three kids sort of back to back, all two years apart, and made the difficult decision to sort of pause my career to stay home with the kids. And so I did that for several years. And then when the last one finally went to preschool, I knew I wanted to get back into the field of mental health in some way, but I knew I couldn't go back to being in the trenches, so to speak. So um, I, at that point, had read all the books on how to help your children sleep well. And I felt like after three kids, I was sort of an expert in that. And so I started this business um, helping families with their children's sleep issues. And quickly it it changed from, you know, how how do I get my six month old to sleep through the night to helping families with really complex um, dynamics going on. So kids on the spectrum or with ADHD, where sleep is really the pain point um, sometimes that starts it all because parents don't have the bandwidth to handle all of that adversity coming their way all day if no one's sleeping. So, and obviously the kids are struggling too. So I really enjoyed that work. Um, but you know, it's, it was hard to maintain some of those personal boundaries because I got very invested in these families and typically they needed help at the same time that I was trying to parent my own kids in the evening. So, um, I did that for four or five years and, and I really enjoyed it. But um, I decided I wanted to kind of take a different path. And um, it was sort of post-COVID. I'd been home with the kids for a while. They were finally going back to school. And I had known um, the owner of of the company of Pacific Prep um, for years. His wife and I were childhood best friends. So I'd always known about Tudor Corps and Pacific Prep. And um, when they were looking for someone to do outreach, I felt like this was, you know, the perfect fit. So That's kind of how I landed here. And I would say in my daily work, I think I tap into all of the the life skills and professional skills that I have had throughout my journey. Um, And it's all kind of wrapped up in this bow. And I just love it every day. (laughs) So what Pacific Preparatory, if I understand it, is it's really one-to-one education for people. and. What ages, give me a little bit about what it does so that I can then pummel you with other questions. <laughs> of course. Um, so we are a private accredited um, school for kindergarten through 12th grade. So, and we really do have that range of students um, that come to us. And what makes it truly unique is that all of the learning is one-on-one. So, and there are no brick and mortar locations. So we have our teachers meeting with their students over Zoom one-to-one. There's no group component at all. So that's a common, you know, misconception or concern that families have knowing all of our experience with remote learning that happened, you know, right at the beginning of COVID. 
um, this is apples and oranges, you know, because it, it truly is one teacher and one student. And all of that teaching is highly customized, completely customized for each student. So because of that, you know, we have a really wide range of families that come to us for different reasons, um, mental health being one of them. So a kid who is just school refusal, too anxious to go to school, too anxious to encounter kids in the hallway, and would be a good candidate for you folks, right? Yes, absolutely. And actually what we're finding is there seems to be recently a really, you know, common intersection between kids that have learning differences and struggling with anxiety and depression. So, um, you know, that that's in, you know, families, there are lots of school options for kids out there, but if families don't live in an area where there's the right fit school, Oftentimes when they're coming to us, they have already tried two or three different environments. And because of their, their students' kind of complex profile and what they need learning, social, you know, eco- emotional wise, um, there's just not the right school. And so then these kids are coming to us very discouraged, having just a really negative relationship to learning, um, which is really everything. I mean, in order for kids to really succeed in school, they need to feel positively about learning, you know? So a lot of that, that relationship has been damaged and um, it, it's causing all of that anxiety. So yeah, we get, a, we have they a lot of students like that. at that moment, the idea that school and learning are synonymous. Yes, exactly. They aren't. They aren't. Yep. Right. Yep. And it's also the relationship between teacher and student that's so important because you know, in the same vein, some of these kids have had, and it's not to say that there's bad teachers, that they've had bad teachers. It's just the teachers are having to manage, do classroom management with, you know, sometimes 20 to 30 kids in the class. And they have a kid who really needs some extra one-on-one support or just some tailored support that they're not set up to provide, you know, in that school, even some schools that are specialized, um, it's just not, you know, they're not set up for success. And so sometimes that relationship between teacher and student has also been damaged. And so that's kind of the first place we focus with kids like that is let's, you know, we can take things slow because in the one-on-one environment, once they get going, it moves very quickly because they're not waiting for a whole classroom of kids to finish, you know, 20 math problems. It's happening live. And so we can really slow down and take the time to build that relationship between teacher and student. And then they just are off to the races. That's wonderful. Yeah. So you work with kids on the spectrum as well. Um, How does that differ from people who are neurotypical in in this? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we do have several kids on the spectrum. Um, One family in particular has two kids that work with us and one of them uses a communication device. So um, he's nonverbal. And so what that looks like is our, our teacher who's phenomenal. She works with his speech therapist every single week to input all of the vocabulary words that they're going to be working on in her class into his communication device. So it's really a team effort with all of the providers working with the family. We really try to be as holistic as we can, um, to meet those kids needs. Cause oftentimes they are working with many different providers and, Specifically for kids on the spectrum, we find that separating the academic piece from their social needs is really the ticket to helping them move along and and succeed. And so, again, because the learning is so concentrated, they do not need to be on Zoom for seven hours a day. So what, what that looks like is several hours in their day that are freed up to do social skills classes, to, you know, work with their therapists, um, to do things that connect them to their peers based on interests and passions, as opposed to having to learn together. That's great, which segues really nicely into the next question that I'm sure every, what do you do about the social component? Yeah. Yes. One to one. Yeah. That is definitely the number one question that we get. And um, the reality is, you know, if you think of us as a homeschooling kind of environment, I mean, truth is they're learning from home, right? And it's definitely a shift for parents who have put their kids in a traditional school where 
all those social needs are met at school. Um, so now they're sort of the in charge of, you know, getting those opportunities for their kids. So as a school, we do a few things. We do try to offer some connection time. So for example, next week, we're having a virtual assembly, kindergarten through 12th grade. We're having an author come. She's sending everyone, you know, signed copies of her books. And she's, you know, just talking about literacy. And it's going to be this great kind of community um, event. And we have book clubs that are separated by age that the teachers run. Um, but that said, we do we do not think that those kinds of events or connections replace real in-person time with their peers. And so we it's actually one of my roles is to help connect parents with people in their local communities so that their kids can really interact with their peers and do fun things. You know, the world of homeschooling has really changed and Thanks to the World Wide Web, there are so many resources in people's local communities, meetup groups, and, you know, just different ways that parents can put together a full, you know, day for their kids. So we just try to help them connect to those resources, too. So let me be blunt. If you are a mom who's used to sending your kiddo off to school and all of a sudden they're in the home... (laughs) How yeah. do you support the parents in navigating that kind of shift? Yes, that is the big shift. I would imagine that many of these parents had no intention of homeschooling. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I have three kids myself. And also, I mean, I really relate to that, um, you know, and, and the ones that, you know, that we're discussing today that haven't kind of been planning this kind of environment for a long time, it is very shocking. And it's it takes a minute to kind of get oriented. Um, What I will say, one worry that parents have is that they're going to have to be standing over their kids, making sure they get on Zoom, you know, being in the room. And that is not the case. And our teachers and the team work really hard with the families to set up some systems so the kids can build that autonomy. Even our little guys, like even our first and second graders, are able to sign on to Zoom and to have all their materials that's really built into the process so that, you know, and we send a lot of physical materials their way too. So their parents are not having to print anything. You know, they're getting, you know, science experiment kits and art materials and the teachers are helping the kids stay organized in their space and with the parents' input as well. So that's one one sort of burden we can take off of their plates. Um, But like you said, you know, it's going to be an adjustment for everyone. And and it it is an adjustment. Sometimes they have to, you know, hire a nanny or have somebody come in to kind of stay with them. And we do the best we can to help them sort of navigate right. that and figure it out. Um, so the, the, I guess the one good thing is that a lot of families have been working from home. So they are you know, we're what three years into this pandemic. So families are kind of used to having to pivot to, okay, someone has to be right. So yeah. Do you offer support services to parents much the same way that a treatment program would a parent group or something like that, where they can talk about the difficulties of having a kid in their home all day? Yeah. Yeah. So we really sort of serve as the connector to all of those resources, just like with the kids. Um, And that's one of my roles too. And I will say, you know, myself and our admissions director, Molly, both of us have a social work background. And I think that's one of the most important, you know, aspects of social work is to really connect people to resources. So she and I both love, absolutely love doing that. But at the same time, we, our team is really supportive to the family. So they're not being passed around to all kinds of different people. It's a very small team. And um, one of our, our curriculum specialists, Erica, she even does some parent coaching. So she has some families that are coming to her because our teachers and our team really see the dynamics of what's happening in the home. And so they really get to know not only the kids, but the families too. And so um, we're, we are not replacing a therapist by any means. And we will always refer out if families ask us for that. But um, it's a really supportive kind of team as the parents are navigating these things. So shifting gears a little bit, what are the themes you're seeing in adolescent mental health present at Pacific Preparatory? Yeah. 
anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. Um, yeah. And a lot of the kids that are coming to us with that have, um, they're in these, you know, very rigorous, high performing high schools where, you know, they, they've held it together for a long time. And now the pressure has just built to the point where, you know, they're in crisis. Um, and it's come out, it may have come out in different ways. They may have developed an eating disorder or they have substance abuse or just, you know, that anxiety and depression where the, you know, it's just, they're not able to go to school every day. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So that's really the biggest issue that that we're seeing. We we also have some kids that are transitioning gender. So we have, you know, some kids that, that that's been an issue in their school. There's been bullying or they want, you know, to, to take some time off while they're going through the transition and get a fresh start somewhere else. So we're seeing some of that as well. Makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Um, what role do you think that social media does play in mental health, either the, the pros and the cons, because yeah. I, I think it's a reality. So how do we have pro social social media? Yeah. That is also a really good question. And one I struggle with as a parent too, I see it, you know, my oldest is 13. So it's really kind of starting. And I think from COVID, you know, again, it's, it's definitely a pro and a con kids were able to connect with one another without being in the same room. And we really need that because they really were feeling very isolated. Um, And so in that way, it does kind of connect us. Uh, But of course that, you know, there's just so many ways that it can go wrong. And, and our, our tweens are not, their brains are not fully developed. And so they don't have that executive functioning and that, you know, impulse control. And when things get put out there, it's out there forever. And so that, that can be really damaging both to them and to others. And so, I mean, I just think that families, this is the hardest um, issue I feel like for parents today. And it's brand new. It's not an issue that our parents had to deal with or any previous generation. And I don't think that there's, you know, there's not enough time that has passed for the research to really tell us how to navigate it. I mean, it's just the social media is moving a lot faster than we can keep up with on the research and and how to respond. So it's just we're we're constantly pivoting and just trying to navigate that. And um, I don't know. I, I my only sort of advice is really to just know what your kids are doing, you know, and and to really build a community amongst parents with your peers, their peers, parents to really inform each other. Um, I give you, I have a. a friend actually right now who uh, my son told me her son was texting at one, two in the morning. And, you know, we're, we're friends. And I felt like I would want to know as surely that's not what she wants. And so I think as parents, we have to band together and say, this is not a space for judgment. Not happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You would want to know that your, your child is not sleeping at one thirty. <laughs> yeah. So Agreed. I agree. Other yeah. moms, other dads are key. They yeah. are. So what haven't I asked you? What else would you like us to know before we close today? Mm -hmm. Um, I just think, you know, with what you do at OPG, I think there's a lot of, you know, crossover in terms of families that when they are struggling with coming out of a treatment program or they're needing time off that, you know, we really like to be sort of a partner in that, Um, you know, when families, and sometimes they, they plan to go back to their school once they, you know, have their mental health stabilized. And we would be more than happy to kind of help with that transition. So because of the level of customization, we can even match, you know, the syllabi for the schools that they're planning to return to. So we try to work with the schools in that way. That's reading the same books, you know, making sure we're, you know, even mirroring some of the same assignments. We can be really flexible and how we work with families. So, and, and we can, you know, customize the amount of time they're doing in their classes um, to fulfill the semester hour requirements. Um, so there's flexibility there as well. So um, yeah, I just, and that's available yeah. only in California. Is that correct? Or national? No, it's uh, nationwide. Yeah. We started in California, Great. but yeah, we have families from all over and teachers from all over as well. Great to know. Well, yeah. thank you for bringing 
a new facet of education to collegial conversations. I've enjoyed the conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Always lovely to talk to you, Diana. Thank you for joining this webinar. Tune into more webinars and sign up for our newsletter at O'ConnorPG.com.